might open your Bibles back up to the place where Abe read for us, Matthew chapter 11, and we'll look there for our lesson. If you have a marker, you might place it there. We'll turn to other passages, but we'll come back to that place from time to time. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but you can't get singing like that just everywhere. Um, that's uh, that's pretty good. And um, I uh, I would like to know the groups that are about our size that have singing like that. I just I don't think that list would be very long. And uh, it was encouraging this morning. Appreciate the good way that Alan led us and good way everybody joined in and participated. And hopefully uh, our our volume and our energy was a reflection of our heart's desire to honor God and to edify one another. And I trust that that is the case. Uh, let me say before I get started with the lesson, how much we appreciate everybody here and the gifts and the prayers and the thoughts and the messages uh, about the birth of Lena. We are so blessed um, at that. That almost feels like a word that's uh, doesn't quite have the capacity to say how thankful we are for God's good blessings and for the group here. Uh, we are just extremely thankful to be a part of this group and the care and the love that you show to us is uh, unmatched, I think. That's another thing you can't find just anywhere. And uh, we've got it here and we're very, very thankful. And uh, Lena and Lydia are both doing well. And uh, it was a, uh, it felt like a long road for, it felt like a long road for me. So I'm sure it felt like a long road for her. Uh, but uh, being able to have Lena with us and uh, it's, uh, it's it's worth it. And so maybe in some ways that kind of reflects on what I'd like to talk about this morning. Uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28, uh, gives us this great invitation. And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, those who labor and are burdened. And that makes the invitation great, because most of the time when we send out invitations, we're not looking for the people that have more problems. We've got enough of our own. We want people who maybe are bringing us something, who are offering us something. And Jesus extends this great invitation to those who are weary and heavy laden. Those who have problems and burdens and challenges and frustrations. And he says, come to me and take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek. And lowly in heart. The invitation is great not only because it is for those who are weak and heavy laden, but because it comes from one who is gentle and humble. And anybody else saying, come to me because I'm humble, well, that would automatically exclude them from humility. But Jesus, whose self-perception is so clear and whose, whose understanding of what we need is so astute, He says, come to me for I am meek and lowly. I have put myself under, uh, my, my strength under control in order to, to bow down and to lower myself for the needs of those to whom I've come to serve. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I think that there is a way that we can look at the entire story of Scripture as a pursuit of God's rest. Um, I think the writer in Hebrews 4, alludes to Genesis chapter 2, that God rested on the seventh day, and then says, and let us pursue that we might enter that rest. There was an old Jewish idea that the, the serpent, serpent came and tested and tempted Adam and Eve on day seven, uh, and that what he was trying to do was take them out of God's rest. The, the satisfaction and the peace and the harmony that came as a result of God's good world and the relationship between man and woman and between man and his God. And, and Satan comes to violate that. And all through the Old Testament, we see all these pictures and shadows and previews of the weight that God puts on rest, the Sabbath day rest, the seven years rest, the Jubilee rest. And Jeremiah, from which Jesus is quoting here, in Jeremiah 6 and verse 16 says, Stand in the old paths and seek and ask for the old ways where the good way is. And he says, you will find rest for your souls. But they, like almost everybody else, said, we will not walk therein. They didn't want the rest that God offered for whatever reason. But Jesus brings this tremendous invitation with a promise of rest. And in response, he calls upon us to take his yoke upon us. 
and to learn of him, to become his disciples. Because he says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And I don't know about you, but I read that and I say his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I mean, just think about the things that Jesus says. I'm not just saying this from my perspective. Uh, there is a song in our book, uh, His Yoke is Easy, His Burden is Light. I found it so. I found it so. Have you? And Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, Matthew 7, 13, 14. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go in by it. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard, difficult that leads to life. And there are few who find it. What about what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37 when he says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then says things like, don't love mom or dad more than me. Don't love son or daughter more than me. Take up your cross. I don't know a lot about crosses, but they don't seem easy. Lose your life for my sake. What about what Jesus will say in Matthew 13 and verse 20 in the parable of the seed and the sower and the soil? And you remember that there were some on whom the seed was scattered and it fell on rocky ground. And in verse 20, he says, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Here's a person who's excited about following Jesus, about hearing the gospel message. And in verse 21, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Jesus says that when people respond to the gospel, persecution and tribulation are going to arise. And I don't think that's an exception for the rocky soil. I think the thorny soil faced persecution and tribulation. I think the good soil faces per persecution and tribulation. It's just that the rocky soil doesn't have the depth to hold on through it. It's not easy. It's not light. Right? Then flip over to what Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 24. Jesus tells Peter that he's going to go to the cross. And Peter says, no, you're not going to go to the cross. And Jesus says, not only am I going to a cross, you're going to a cross. Verse 24, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Self-denial, taking up your cross, losing your life. Doesn't sound like easy. Doesn't sound like light. And let's be clear. When Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he is not saying that it's not a high calling. He's not saying it's not going to require sacrifice. He's not saying that it won't cost you. In fact, he says it'll cost you everything. Remember the man who said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere on earth to lay his head. What's he telling that man? He says it's a high cost. It's going to cost you. It's going to require sacrifice and endurance and difficulty. He never hid that cost. In fact, he called upon people to count the cost. I, I'm, uh, the, the account in, in Luke 14 and verse 25, a great crowd accompanied him. What would Jesus say to a great crowd? Well, he said, to try to draw more people in, infinitely. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then he gives several illustrations. A man building a tower, a general a king looking at his army, preparing to go to war. And the point of those is count the cost. You need to think now about whether or not you're going to be ready to endure what you're going to have to endure because the cost is high and the sacrifice will be heavy. Jesus wanted people who were all in. And so in verse 33, he said, whoever does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. 
perhaps from time to time talking to people who are thinking about becoming a Christian and they're learning about what that would demand and they say, well, would I have to give up? Whatever it is. And maybe it's something they don't have to give up. But you know, it might be a good question to say, would you be willing to? Would you be willing to? Because if anything has a hold, so hard of a hold on our heart that we wouldn't be willing to give it up, we're not ready. We don't renounce all that we have and we cannot be his disciple. But if that's the case, how can his yoke be easy and his burden light? I think that's worth pondering because Jesus says that it is. Well, think about one way that his yoke is easy in contrast to uh, pharisaical burdens. I think the environment into which Jesus was speaking, and I think this is helpful to think about because it's right there in the same context. Jesus offers rest on, on the very next occasion that we read about in Matthew chapter 12. They are on the Sabbath day, the day of rest. And what do the Pharisees do? They come to Jesus and they criticize his disciples because on this day of rest, they have gotten some grain out of the grain field and they rubbed it between their hands and they have eaten the seeds that were there. And the Pharisees say, why do your disciples do what is not lawful? Here's the thing. They only broke the Pharisees' traditions. They didn't break God's law. And Jesus says a lot here, but in verse 7, he says, If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. And there are other accounts that I think flesh that out even more. And, and Mark's account, I think especially, talks about the fact that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So what happens here? The Pharisees take what God had meant to be as literally rest, as something that was a relief, as something that was a blessing to people. And because of their traditions and because of their misinterpretations, they had made it into an onerous weight. They, they, could Jesus be, at least in part, telling his hearers not to think of him as another Pharisee who came to burden them even more, but in some meaningful way was offering them relief? And one way he was doing that was pointing to what God had always really wanted and not adding those extra man-made weights. We'll probably have more to say on that in a minute. But I think another way, an even more profound way that Jesus responds to the Pharisees is that the way of Jesus is a lighter burden in regards to the way that they were pursuing righteousness. I want you to think through this with me for a few minutes. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5. First, in Matthew 5 and verse 19, Jesus says that whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. First thing I want to notice there. It's when Jesus says his burden is light. He is not saying that means you don't have to worry about obedience. Because in Matthew 5 and verse 19, he says, actually, the very smallest commandments, the least of the commandments, if you break those and teach other people to do the same, you are least in the kingdom of heaven. And in the context of Matthew, I think least means out. In fact, in verse 20, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds, unless it surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And they must have looked at each other and said, the Pharisees and the scribes are the most righteous people we know. How in the world are we going to be able to exceed their righteousness? When Jesus says, that their righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. It doesn't sound easy or light. But Jesus has promised us that it is. And so we need to ponder it more carefully. Now what he means when he says that their righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Is that their righteousness needed to go more than skin deep. That it has to go right to the heart. 
right to their core, from the inside out, that external restraint is not enough. You know the Sermon on the Mount. Righteousness must be cultivated through and through. Now, in one way, that doesn't sound easy, right? Uh, you shall not commit murder. So far, so good, right? Uh, 33 years, and as far as I know, haven't. I'm, I'm okay. But ridding myself of unrighteous anger? That's another story. That's higher and deeper and further than I've been able to attain. And in one sense, that's not easy. But I want you to think about it in another way. Consider the man who says, I won't commit adultery, but I'm going to continue to look in lust. Is that an easy burden? Is that a light load? I think that man's going to be torn in two. If he would work to root out that lust, then he would have harmony in his heart and in his action. There wouldn't be that discord in himself. But as long as he says, I'm going to not commit adultery, but I'm going to keep looking to lust, he's never going to have rest. His heart is going to be pulled in one direction and his body is going to be pulled in another direction. And he's going to be constantly in turmoil. I want you to think about the person who makes a commitment to serve God. But they leave all of their old habits and their old patterns and their old associations and their old temptations right in place. How easy and light is that burden going to be? Not at all. That person will never have the rest Jesus offers. Their hearts will be in constant turmoil. But Jesus calls us to something higher. He says, whatever, you would, keep, whatever would keep you from following me fully and completely, cut it off. Right? Easy? Light? In one sense, it's the hardest thing you're ever going to do. But if you'll take Jesus' yoke, if you'll learn of Him, if you'll take His burden, if you'll commit all the way, then in reality, your weight will be easier and lighter than the person who tries to follow Jesus on the one hand, but also tries to hold on to all of that on the other hand. That person will be ripped to shreds. I remember... Preachers, as I was growing up, talking about people who had one foot in the world and one foot in church. And they would explain when they're in the world, they feel guilty because they know better. And while they're at church, they're frustrated because they really want to be doing what the world does. Now, the way it really works is if you've got one foot in the world, you've got both feet in the world. But I think we get the point. Trying to be faithful in half measures just rips us apart. What's hard, what's burdensome is wanting the benefits of what Jesus offers without wanting to become what Jesus calls us to. That's hard. That's not an easy burden to bear. It's hard because people who want to do that don't count the cost. It's hard because they want oppos opposed things. What Jesus wants us to do is to cultivate a righteousness where we long to where what we long to be is righteous and where we are committed to that from the inside out. And so perhaps Jesus is saying to us, the Pharisees are offering you a path where you get to think however you want, but you can't do anything about it. That's an awfully heavy burden to bear. What I'm calling you to do is much deeper and higher than that. I'm calling upon you not just to change your actions and your habits, but to change your thinking too. But if you, if you really won't rest, that's the only way. Jesus' yoke, Jesus' burden, Jesus' way is for the weary and for the heavy laden. But the way you lay that burden down is by taking His all the way on. And that's the only way to do it. Well, Jesus' yoke is easy in contrast to the burden of sin. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? What about the weight and what about the burden of unforgiven sin? What about the a guilty conscience? What does Jesus offer? He offers rest. I think sometimes we have the impression that the choice is between Jesus' yoke and no yoke. That it's between Jesus' burden and no burden. But that's not the choice that stands before us. The choice that stands before us is between Jesus' yoke and Satan's. It's between Jesus' burden and the devil's. 
It's the choice between the weight of an atoning king and a cruel taskmaster. The false promise that the devil offers is freedom, but it is no freedom. It is bondage to a master whose desire for his most devoted followers is eternal damnation. The guilt of sin, the guilt of sin, wrecks people's self-esteem. And in some sense, rightly so, right? We should not feel great about ourselves with the guilt of sin. But the devil's yoke offers no remedy for that. Tell me that our drug crisis, prescription and not, isn't a reflection of something deeper. I, was, I heard a story about a preacher. I think he was from a denominational background. But he was offered an extremely high salary to go and work for a psychiatry practice. And he said, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a preacher. And they said, yes, but 95% of the people who come in here, their problem is, is they are guilty and don't know what to do about it. And they think that psychiatry or medicine or something like that is going to fix it, and it won't. The, the path of sin wrecks people's lives. The guilt of sin, the path of sin, Solomon said it right, the way of the transgressor is hard. Now that doesn't mean that you come to Christ and the way is rosy. It does mean that those who refuse to take Christ's yoke have their own heavy yoke to bear. They have their own hard road to hope. The end of sin wrecks people's eternity. Satan says, you don't need Christ with His authority and His rule and His reign and His yoke and His burden. And a lot of people say, you're right. I don't like anybody telling me what to do. I don't like yokes. I don't like burdens. And we spend our whole lives telling Christ, we don't want Him, we don't want His rule, we don't want His reign. And one day it will come that the Lord will give the one who has rejected Him exactly what they've been pursuing their whole lives. An eternity without Him and without His reign and without His rules and without His authority. But the problem is, is that those people don't recognize that where Christ reigns, there is peace and there is love, and there is justice, and there is righteousness, and there is rest. And it's only there. And we live in this world, and one of the common blessings that we all share is that we all have a taste in that. Even so often when we are rejecting God's rule and reign over our lives, we still have a taste of the blessings that come from God's rule of this world. But hell will be the place where all that Christ offers, His rule and His blessing will be absent. And so the devil says, you don't want his yoke, and he saddles us with another yoke that will drag us straight to eternal destruction. To be sure, there is what the Hebrew writer calls a passing pleasure of sin. And I think that's what Jesus means in Matthew 7 and 14 when he says that the way is hard. Because we have to be willing to give up the passing pleasure of sin in pursuit of the treasure that Christ offers. But there is nothing more destructive than making our decisions based on the immediate without concern, considering the long-term ramifications. In every facet of life, the most destructive thing you can do is make decisions only for today. And it's in that sense that Jesus is offering us an easier and a lighter way. He's saying, yes, it may seem harder now, but look at the big picture. Think about as far as Jesus' yoke being easy and light, the relief of forgiveness. Jesus bore the really heavy burden. He bore the burden that we could not have borne so that He can give us one that is easy and light. Again, not that it's not a high and holy calling. It is. But the provision of forgiveness means that even even the high and holy calling of Jesus is a burden that we can bear. Christ has not called us to a calling that we cannot handle. Because of His forgiveness, even our failures are not final or fatal. And so the calling is high. I've referenced 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. John says, My little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. That's a high calling. Leave sin behind. Cut it off. Get away from it. 
Later on in 1 John 2, he will say that the person who's born of God does not keep on sinning. Just stop it. It's a high call. Hard in some ways. Difficult. My little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but for the whole world. The burden is light. It's a high calling. It's a deep calling. It's a far calling. But it is a, provi- it is a calling with a provision. Now, the yoke, the burden is one of discipleship, learning of him. He is the standard. Come, learn of me. Jesus is the standard. It couldn't be any more demanding than that. Except that He is also the meek and lowly. He is also the merciful and gracious. He's also the gentle and humble. The one, in verse 25, as Abe read for us, who is thankful that God didn't reveal this to wise people, but to infants. The person who invites not the rich and well done, but the weary and heavy laden. It's a high calling, but it is the calling of one who only has our best at heart. And I think that that leads us to a change in perspective. I want you to think with me that what Jesus is calling people to is not easier an easier calling, but an easier weight because of how we're thinking about that calling. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, excuse me, Acts 5, and this should be 40 through 42, not 30 through 32. So they called in the apostles, they beat them, they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They beat them. These are the same people that Jesus had promised, come to me and I'll give you a birth that's, that's easy and light. And they, they're beaten because they're preaching Christ. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Look at that change in perspective. Their yoke is easy. And their burden is light, even when they are dealing with tremendous suffering. Because they're thinking about it differently. They're thinking about it differently than they would otherwise. How can we think about it differently? Well, we can understand that His commandments are always for our good. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. Moses is talking about the son who one day is going to ask the father, why do we keep all these rules? And what the father is to answer is he's to tell him the story of redemption. God rescued us out of Egypt and He brought us through the wilderness and He brought us to this land that He had promised to our fathers. The Lord commanded us to keep these commandments. For our good always, verse 24 says. Well, how do we know they're for our good always? Well, because it's the same God giving them that rescued us and preserved us and kept His promises to us. And the kind of God that does all of that is not going to give us commandments that are for our harm. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. Does that mean that they're always easy to follow? Does that mean they're always that they're always just... Just it's what I was going to do anyway. No. But we know that he would never give us anything that is not for our good. Even the trials that we must face are shaping us to be like Christ. And so in the face of trial, James says, Peter says, you can rejoice. Why? Because the trying of your faith produces patience. And patience having its perfect work, having its perfect work, brings forth maturity, completion. It makes you more like what you ought to be. Now, how do we know that what Jesus commands us is always for our good? Well, there's a lot of ways we can think about this. But the most significant way that we know His commandments for our good is because He laid down His life for us. So whenever Christ gives a command, whatever reason He has for giving us that instruction cannot be that He doesn't love us. The passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. Paul says there, 
For the love of Christ compels us or controls us or constrains us. The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We give our lives to him because of what he gave to us. And it's not a heavy burden. It's not a wearisome task because we are loyal to him. We're loyal to him. I think it was so burdensome and, fa- and, and hard what the Pharisees were doing. It's because they weren't loyal to God. They were loyal to the rules. Rules are a big part of it. But when we are loyal to Christ, w- w- whatever you want, Lord, whatever you want. We know that feeling. People who have made great sacrifices for us. Uh, a little baby that we love. Doesn't mean it's pleasant. Doesn't mean it's enjoyable. We wouldn't have it any other way. We'll do whatever they need. Whatever. Because we want what's best. I'm I'm thinking again about the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, and how we could apply this idea here. If you think about the man, uh, this is in verse 38 and following. Jesus says, you've heard eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I say to you, don't resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Jesus, This is the same Jesus that says his burden is easy. And I, may, I know I've made that point a lot. But I just want you to see that it looks like a disconnect, doesn't it? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. If somebody slaps you on your right cheek, you just turn to them the other one and offer that one too. I don't know if I know what the words easy and light mean anymore. If anyone would sue you and take your overcoat, your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Or your, your inner coat, in your shirt, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now you might say, how is that an easy burden? That looks heavy. That looks hard. I don't want you to think about a change of perspective. I want to be like Jesus. That's what I want. I want to be like Jesus. And here comes a Roman soldier. And I think that's probably the context of what's going on here. Here comes a Roman soldier and slaps you on the right cheek. Now, you, you, you have limited options here, right? You are a Jew under Roman occupation. And this only seems like a heavy burden. It only seems like a curse. Unless you say, I've taken Jesus' yoke. And you say, Mr. Soldier, I've been trying to learn self-denial. And I think you can help me with that. Here's my left one. And the one who sues you and takes your tunic and you say, you know, sir, I've been working on trying to renounce all that I have so that nothing competes with my devotion to Christ. You've helped me see more clearly. Here's my cloak, too. The Roman soldier that comes and literally lays a heavy burden on you. And you have limited options, right? You must carry this burden. And you can walk the whole way angry and mad and frustrated. Or you can say, you know, when we get to mile marker one, you can think to yourself, I'm just going to go another one. Because I've really been struggling with trying to be humble and, and look for ways to be generous. And I think that would be good. And as the Roman soldier, maybe he didn't see the mile marker. And you keep going and you keep going. And he said, surely he knows how long a mile is. Surely he was watching for it. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, well, sir, I've been trying to bear Jesus yoke. And I thought this was a good opportunity to learn some humility and meekness and sacrifice. You see, Jesus offers a way to take what the world means for us only as our harm and use it to become more like him. His commandments are always for our good and never for our harm. And so in that way, no matter what he asks us, because of who he is, because of how much we love him, because we want, for what we know him to be, his burden is always light. It is never burdensome, even though it might cost us everything, because most of all, we want to look like him. It's always for our good. I won't spend long on this, but I do want you to think about the fact that he blesses us all along the way. 
Uh, in Matthew 19, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. And I think here we see a picture of the man who wants to have it both ways, right? Who has one foot with God and one foot with the world, or wants it to be that way anyway. And he has, he wants to, he wants eternal life, this precious thing. And Jesus says, if you want it, go sell all that you have and give the poor. Come follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. And the rich man goes away sorrowful because he has many great possessions. He had great possessions. What's going on there? Here's a man who wants what Jesus offers without wanting to be what Jesus wants him to be. So he's ripped apart. He goes away sorrowful. He's not happy about walking away, but he walks away. And Peter comes and he says, Lord, we've left all and followed you. I think basically he's saying, if that's the case, if walking away from everything is what it takes to have eternal life, we've left everything. What's in it for us? And Jesus says in Matthew 19, in verse 28, Truly I say to you, you have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. You also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone, I think that includes you and me, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. Now, we'll get to that last part in just a second. But think about the fact. Jesus says, you've got to hate your mother and father to come follow me. What does that mean? It means that if mom and dad are standing in the way of me being faithful to Christ, I'm following Christ. It, it means if there's different demands for going along with son and daughter versus going along with Christ, I'm going with Christ. And you say, in what, in what universe is that easy? In the universe where when you come, you get hundredfold mothers and brothers and sisters where we have one another and so no matter who we have to walk away from or what we have to walk away from together we have it all and that was God's design to bless us and above and beyond that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ if I didn't receive one good thing here I have every spiritual blessing all along the way in Christ. And finally, the reward, I should say, will be worth it all. The reward will be worth it all. Matthew chapter 11 in the Sermon on the Mount, again, maybe in some ways the Sermon on the Mount is an exposition of what it means for his burden to be easy. Yoke is easy and burden light. Matthew 11, blessed are you, blessed, blessed, happy. Fortunate are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter, utter all kinds of evil against you, false on my account. Isn't that exactly what you think, right? When you're being persecuted and you just say, boy, how lucky am I? Jesus says, more so than you think. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for so persecuted they the prophets who are before you. We were talking about this on our Saturday morning study. And Austin brought up the example, and I thought it was so powerful and helpful. The reward's going to be worth it. We know what that feels like when you're doing hard things, but it goes by easy because you know what's on the other side. And he gave the example, Genesis 29 and verse 20. Jacob is laboring for Rachel. He has to work seven years for her hand in marriage. And do you remember what the text says? that those seven years seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Now, he didn't have to sweat any less. He didn't have to work any, hard, any less hard. It wasn't any actually any less time for him than it was any of those other guys working out in the field. But for him, because of what was waiting on the other side, that burden was easy. That yoke was easy and that burden was light. And so Paul would say things like 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, that the, uh, the, the eternal weight of glory that's being produced for us means that this, he calls it a momentary light affliction. The things Paul went through, he calls them a momentary light affliction. He says, are producing for us an eternal weight of glory. In Romans 8, he says, the things that we are suffering now are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed.
Jesus, His yoke is easy and His burden is light because He offers us the opportunity to get something out of this life. We're all dying. We can't keep any of it anyway. And again, we think the option is between keeping our life or losing it for Christ. And in some way, that is the option. But even if we keep it, even if we save our life for ourselves, it's only for a little while. And Jesus says, give your life for me now and I will give you real life. I'll give you true life. One writer who died trying to take the word of God to foreign nations said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'll tell you, I have a blessed life. I cannot keep one bit of it. And if the day comes where I have to give it all up and the world looks at me as a fool, I hope I have the courage to say I'm no fool to give up what I cannot keep to keep what I cannot lose. There's only one way that this life pays off and Jesus says it's by following me. The way is hard, the gate is narrow, but it is possible. And we should say, show me the way. And he has shown us the way. So the invitation comes to us. Jesus says, I'm calling you to give up everything. I'm calling you to hand over control to me. I'm calling you to break off your allegiance to self and to sin and to Satan. Won't it be hard? Oh yes, count the cost. But in reality, it's easy and it's light because it is the burden of a master who only has your best in mind and who only has your rest in view. So the invitation is open. Alan's going to lead us in a song that encourages you to accept it. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Won't you accept the Lord's invitation while we stand and while we sing? Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.